Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rotor World Football Show. I am Patrick Doherty, hopefully joined today by Mr. Kyle Dvorak. He's having some technical difficulties as we gear up to preview the AFC South. And we have three amazing guests uh, here to help you break down the division. That begins with the Athletics, James Boyd, who covers the Colts, uh, the Nick Suss from the Nashville Tennessean to talk the Titans, later SI.com's John Shipley, back for the third year in a row, to talk about the Jags. Uh, but we're here with James first. Uh, we're here with some of the biggest name players in fantasy football, which is a big change for the Colts, James. Uh, like they've got fantasy superstars again, one of whom has only played four NFL career games. Uh, but we're just talking off the air. We're going to be picking your brain on uh, you know these guys and maybe what to expect in fantasy this year. You said you don't play fantasy, uh, but you are very familiar with people like us bombarding you all day with questions. Yeah, I don't play. I feel like if I did, I would just go on a rabbit hole during the, during the season. I try to make sure that I'm keeping – everything on the up and up with my job first. But I will say I get text messages like you wouldn't believe this time of year, especially whenever an injury happens, I'll get text oh, messages yeah. from, you know, uh, parents that I used to write about their kids when they were in high school, old friends from high school, coaches. And I'm like, I didn't even know you still had my number. And so who is this? Things like that. And I usually sit them out. I'm like, hey, do what you want because I don't want to give you any advice. And it goes wrong. And then you're like, you know what? I hate you. Or I give you some advice and it's great for like two weeks and the third week it's bad. So I try to keep it uh, neutral. Yeah. It's not always the most charitable audience. You're like, dude, I was just trying to help you. Like, <laughs> exactly. You, know, exactly. you, you got to make the decisions. I'm just giving you the information. Uh, yeah. So we apologize in advance for all of that. And I also apologize in advance. I mean, you know, I even know the grind of the NFL season. It's totally different on a beat writer level. And we're here at your last week of vacation and uh, just yeah, condolences man. on the next six months. <laughs> not having exactly. Life. I'm not looking forward to the hot sun, but I am looking forward to seeing some football again. I feel like I drive myself crazy because as soon as the Super Bowl is over, I'm like, all right, we got to wait a while. And then when things start ramping up, I'm like, I do want a summer, but I do want football again. So it's always a, a toss up of the two. Uh, one quick final question before we get into the fantasy. Is, is this coinciding with the release of NCAA 25? Is that something you were hoping to do in your spare time or are you not a gamer? So, no, I'm not a gamer. Um, I stopped probably around high school, but I have enjoyed seeing all of the memes, Patrick, with all of the people who are saying, like, oh, I'm going to get distracted when this song gets played or I'm going to, you know, cut this guy if he's, you know, majoring in whatever major. That isn't an easy one. So I've enjoyed uh, seeing all the memes, all the jokes about it. A bunch of my friends are um, kind of re reliving their youth. So it's cool. <laughs> I've been enjoying it. I, I'm 37 with four children. I don't think my wife will be enjoying it when I do purchase it. <laughs> but uh, planning to purchase it on Friday. Uh, planning to talk with the Colts right now, though, uh, James. And we'll just start right off the top. Where the Colts have a number of fantasy superstars. After what was kind of a follow period following Andrew Luck's retirement, uh, but no one bigger in the fantasy community than Anthony Richardson, even though he's only played four career NFL games and fantasy dual threat quarterbacks, it is so, so valuable. Fantasy drafters are still betting on him despite the injury marred rookie year. He's currently the QB five, an underdog in summer best ball drafts. Uh, it puts him between Patrick Mahomes and CJ Stroud. So people just have like stratospheric expectations for this young man. And we'll just start with like, it's the all systems go after the shoulder surgery. We know he was, he was kind of getting some management days in the off season program. And kind of more importantly, has there been any indication his playing style might change this year? Because fantasy, you know, we're all in on the Anthony Richardson rushing. Exactly. You want him running the ball. I don't think there should be some huge change in the way he's used. I think that his injury last year against the Titans in week five, which ended his season after four games, was unlucky rather than unwise. I don't think it was something where you look at it and you're like, oh, my gosh, they have to change everything to do with him. It was just a matter of now can he hold up if he is used as a runner. And I think what makes him special is his ability to use his legs. The guy, I tried to get too ahead of myself, but he is in that 1% of athlete I've ever seen. And I've worked in the NBA, as I was telling you all off air, I've been around LeBron James. I've been around, you know, Giannis Kumbo, and I've seen players who are just athletic freaks. And he's one of those freaks. And it is special to see it on the football field. So I wouldn't expect too many changes there. His shoulder, I believe is hundred percent at this point. I know there was, a little bit of scare here in Indy because, as we know, Andrew Luck, his shoulder, it kind of, you know, marred the franchise for a few years. But I don't think it was a huge deal. He wasn't too worried about it. They said at the time that, you know, had there been a game upcoming, he would have practiced and played. And then, you know, his agent posted a video 
a few weeks ago at this point where he was at the Nike LeBron campus on the court and he went up and reverse dunked it like LeBron. And I was like, all right, the shoulder looks pretty good there. So um, take it for someone who knows. <laughs> I played pickup basketball with Anthony Richardson last summer. It was yeah. crazy because he just showed up at the YMCA right before he signed his rookie deal. So I believe in his contract now, there's probably no more pickup games. So I got the last yes. pickup game of Anthony Richardson's life or the foreseeable future. And um, he seems to be all systems go. He's excited about it. And he's eager to prove that, you know, those four promising games that we saw weren't a fluke or they weren't an anomaly. That'll be what he is over a full season. Uh, hopefully he did not posterize you, by the way. Uh, or no, no that so you know what? Cool. Look, Patrick, I was terrified to get near the guy because I was like, if you sprain an ankle, if you sprain a finger, everyone in Indianapolis is going to like find me and beat me down. So um, it was like terrifying. It's a cool like story to tell. But no, I got on a fast break once and I stopped to try to jump shot because I was like, one, you're going to LeBron me off the glass if I go in for this layup. Or two, you're going to land on my foot and everything's going to go sideways. So um, I told him, I'm like, you got to go somewhere else where we're not around you because it was uh, pretty scary. But I'll tell you this last thing I'll say. The first play of the game, seriously, they threw it from half court. He caught it and reverse dunked it. And I was like, okay, you could have went pro in basketball if you wanted to, too. So God has favorites, clearly. Yes. <laughs> the Rotor World headline would have, would have been Colt the Beat Writer Injures Fantasy Sensation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my <laughs> gosh. I would have been stoned. Yeah, yeah. so good thing uh, Colts fans weren't the only ones panicking, at, like the one rest day, by the way. Like the entire fantasy community was like, oh, my gosh, he's still hurt. Uh, but no, really good to hear. Uh, that he's on the straight and narrow with his health. Uh, not surprising that he's probably going to be uh, cut loose for training camp. But what was surprising to a lot of people uh, was the Colts taking A.D. Mitchell in the second round. Not that he was not a second-round prospect, even a first-round prospect, according to some people. But he was just kind of a polarizing uh, prospect because of a spotty college production. Uh, but he has the unbelievable speed. He has the field-stretching ability. He seems to be the clear favorite, correct me if I'm wrong, to be the Colts' top outside wideout. Um, you yourself reported in May he was flashing his potential all over OTAs. Um, is this going to be a situation where fantasy managers kind of regret focusing on Mitchell's cons instead of his pros? Or do you think that maybe we're right to be skeptical of like a big rookie year, at least statistically? I think you're right to be skeptical, mainly because you still don't know for sure what you have with Anthony Richardson. Like I said, you want to say, oh, he's going to be this. Well, we have to see it over a bigger sample size. But with A.D. Mitchell – I'd be lying if I said he wasn't impressive throughout the spring. I mean, the guy just made plays. The ability to separate top of routes, get open. And he also has, you know, this weird, like, he contorts his body in a ton of different ways. Reggie Wayne, who obviously knows a thing or two about catching the ball, he's the Colts wide receiver coach now. He was saying how special AD is at just maneuvering his body when the ball is in the air to come down with it. And so I don't think that he's going to come out and, like, set the world on fire so to speak, because he is competing with Alec Pierce, who is, to me, the incumbent starter as the deep threat wide receiver three on this roster. But he should be able to compete for that starting role pretty quickly, because in my eyes, you wouldn't have drafted Eddie Mitchell in the second round if you were, you know, just set in stone on Alec Pierce. So uh, I do think Anthony will be a big factor in that because he can't push the ball down the field more than Gardner Minshew did when he was injured last year. But Eddie Mitchell, man, he looks like he can be a player. And to your point, Patrick, when we talk to, you know, the head decision makers about why you chose him, the biggest reason why they think he went to the second round was that he didn't have, you know, that thousand yard season in college. He didn't have back to back dominant seasons. He just had big moments. And I'll just say with Shane Steichen, you know, so far, I just trust that he will be able to pull the best out of you because I've never seen, you know, um, someone who is as robotic as him as far as the answers he gives us but then also as creative as he is as far as offensive schemes. So I think that he's going to bring the best out of A.D. Mitchell. And if there's any way that he can exploit his strengths, he's going to do it. Yeah, getting that team to 9-8 and eight with Gardner Minshew last year after the quarterback injury. Yeah, and like having a watchable offense, we were not expecting that in fantasy. And yeah, Kyle's going to ask you about Michael Pittman. We weren't expecting Michael Pittman uh, to do quite what he did in fantasy last year. So, Kyle, uh, what do we want to ask about Mike? Yeah, I mean, last year it felt like the offense, once it changed from Anthony Richardson to Gardner Minshew, was really the perfect offense for Michael Pittman. I mean, that's partly because when you have Michael Pittman and a backup quarterback, 
you throw to Michael Pittman a lot. <laughs> yeah. see, like it makes sense to me. Like I'm not surprised that that's how it played out given the circumstances. Do you think that changes given that they actually have their starting quarterback who's known as a deep threat savant and maybe not the most accurate zero to 10, you know, 10 yard a dot kind of guy. Do you think they change to feature Michael Pittman less? Not that he won't be the number one, but just that he's not this PPR machine target hog from a fantasy perspective. That's a great question, Kyle. I do think that he's still probably going to be in the tops as far as targets and catches and things like that, because throughout his career in Indianapolis, he's just been that guy. I mean, he's had a ton of different quarterbacks, but if you look at his numbers, he usually can't produce no matter who's back there. And I think that with, and it comes to Anthony, he's going to look for that safety, you know, valve, that safety blanket. And, you know, with their offense, it's just, if you get the ball in Michael Pittman Jr.'s vicinity, usually good things happen. He's not going to beat you deep very often. As fantasy users know, he's not going to score a lot of touchdowns. At least um, he wants to change that this season. We've been on him. And he's been saying, I got to stop getting tackled at the one yard line. But <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Other than that, the dude is a very good possession catcher. I mean, it's almost like a layup. If you just throw it to him on a slant, he's going to fight for the ball. He's physical. He has great hands. And I do think he's going to still be a huge focal point in his offense because so much is changing. I'm not saying that, you know, Anthony and the offense itself is going to change, but the fact that he's playing more is changing. And the one constant you want to try to keep yourself calm with is knowing that you have a number one guy who's going to win pretty much every time. So get the ball to him and then figure it out from there. So I would expect him and his numbers to sort of be in the same tier and then to kind of see who else, you know, kind of folds in behind him. And then maybe later in the season, do you see more distribution from there? But to start off, I think that he's going to get a lot of targets and mainly because, um, you know, Chris Bow, the coach GM has joked about it. If he doesn't get a lot of targets, he's the first guy in his office every week saying, hey, man, give me the ball. And this could be after a win, after a loss. He does not care. And that's what I love about Michael Pittman Jr. He's uh, he's he's like the anti-diva receiver in a way because he doesn't really, you know, complain too much, at least publicly. But best believe when we talk to him, you know, <laughs> off to the side or talk to anybody else in the organization, they're like, no, this guy wants the ball as bad as anybody else. And, um, you know, he signed it off one time last year where he really let loose in the media. But other than that, um, he usually is, you know, pretty tempered because he's getting eight targets a game. You kind of already answered this question in the, in the affirmative, but yeah, I was just wondering, like as a fantasy community, if we like misread Michael Pittman and Anthony Richardson, because it's a very small sample size, but he he got like 10 or 12 targets, like the th two or three games he and AR played to completion last year. And it just sounds like m maybe you kind of, you're not expecting maybe 109 catches again, it sounds like, but that, like it's no. not going to be surprising if AR is just targeting, like peppering him with targets. Oh, absolutely. I mean, realistically, I can still see him getting in like that 90 catch range or obviously over a thousand yards. And like I said, he wants to get in the end zone more. But throughout his career, when he has had really good seasons, it's been about five or six touchdowns, maybe four. Um, want to see that number go up for himself. And obviously, if you're drafting him in fantasy, but I just wouldn't expect him to drop off a ton because they have A.D. Mitchell, who's going to prove himself in the NFL. And also because of Josh Downs, who we'll get to. He's a good player as well, but I think that just the number one uh, role in this offense is clear, and it won't be all that close as far as targets and production because, to me, Michael Pittman Jr. is still a pretty versatile receiver. He's not a super deep, fast guy, but you can throw it you know, to him deep because he can go up and get it. And um, he says it all the time, like most receivers, just throw it, throw it to my way and good things happen. So, um, you know, so far throughout this offense, that's been the case. I mean, to your, to your point with Pittman – uh, this is going to be the best quarterback he's ever had. And he's, he's hit 90 catches essentially three years in a row. So he's going to find a way, it seems like, uh, to the targets, to the catches. But you mentioned Josh Downs, one of the guys behind him, who was having kind of an unheralded productive rookie year last year uh, before the injury. And he's not he's just not a guy who's getting talked about a lot right now in fantasy. He's going outside the top 60 receivers. Is he, is he kind of shaping up as someone will regret having been like a forgotten man? Or is it just kind of too many mouths to feed in this offense that has an elite running back, has a hot shot young rookie receiver? Or do you think like Josh Downs um, can find his way to a st statistically impressive season uh, in 2024? I'm glad you asked this because we just did a piece in The Athletic where we had to list our potential breakout stars for fantasy. And Josh Downs was my pick. Obviously, there's going to be other fantasy players on this team that can do really well. But if you're looking like a, for a sleeper, I think that he's flown under the radar 
after having a really productive rookie season right before he had sort of a knee issue. He played, I believe, in almost every game, if not every game. But he did kind of taper off after the knee injury. Um, but he had a Indianapolis rookie record, franchise record, 68 catches last year for over 700 yards and two touchdowns. And he's an explosive player. And the, I guess, cheat code I'll throw your, you all's way, and maybe I'm just telling too many people, when – Ever Anthony Richardson gets in trouble, at least throughout camp and throughout those few games that he played, if it wasn't Michael Pittman Jr., it was Josh Downs. And I believe Josh Downs um, was really productive throughout the spring. I mean, there was early in the spring period where Michael Pittman Jr. got dinged up on a play and missed a couple of practices. And then it seemed like after that practice, every single time that Anthony Richardson needed the ball to like get completed or get down the field or get yards, it was going to Josh Downs. We were like, okay, who's that guy popping over in the middle? Oh, that's Josh Downs. Who's that guy in the flat? That's Josh Downs. Who's that guy going deep? That's Josh Downs. And so I think that he's going to be a very productive player in this offense. And obviously if he's a productive player in real life and real offense, he'll be productive in fantasy. So he's a sleeper, I would say for sure. I don't know if I would take him, um, you know, or wait to take him as long as some people are, because I do think that he is sort of that safety valve and he just has this good knack of getting open in the slot. And I think with Anthony, there's still going to be a lot of rhythm throws that they're going to incorporate. So, of course, you want to see him push it down the field. When you got to get the chains moving, I think that he's a guy who's going to see a lot of balls on like that third and six, third and eight type of uh, range. If you had given me 10 guesses to who owned the all-time Colts rookie receptions record, I do not think I would have guessed Josh Downs. I believe that's what you said, but is that what you said? That he, yeah, yeah, I would he, not have guessed that. Record really. last year. I believe it was held before that by Marvin Harrison Jr., so obviously good company to keep. Oh, man, that is shocking. Uh, Kyle is going to change gears uh, to the running game now. He was before he was frozen. Poor Kyle is having the most technical <laughs> difficulties. Uh, it's all good. Jonathan Taylor, I mean, before Anthony Richardson, he was the only fantasy guy that we really cared about in this offense. I mean, the absolutely legendary 2021 season, which sounds crazy because it, it's hard to believe it's already been three years. And just the two kind of years in the wilderness for Jonathan Taylor, uh, last year with the contract, then the injuries, you know, then maybe the conditioning wasn't quite up to speed after and kind of in a com random committee, not a true committee, uh, but right. like you know, Zach Moss getting the ball, like so much more than fantasy players expected or Colts fans expected. Mm -hmm. just, where is Jonathan Taylor at after that bizarre? We know he's paid and we know he's one of the highest paid running backs in the NFL. And it stands to reason he's going to get really huge workloads. But just, yeah, what was like the, the state of play with Jonathan Taylor and the Colts? And does everything kind of seem back to normal? and ready to basically feed JT in 2024. Yes, Patrick. I am so glad that he got paid, mainly because I'm happy whenever a player gets paid. It's not my money, so go get yours. <laughs> but last summer, I was reading through the CBA after he requested a trade because it was like, all right, what does this all mean? And can he hold out? Can he hold in? Can a team trade him? Can they not? It was all these different things. And I was like, I was deep in the bylaws of the CBA, which was not fun <laughs> at all. But I will no. say this year – and we were talking to Chris Ballard about this, again, the Colts GM at the owners' meetings. It's like, hey, all this stuff is behind him, and he's paid now. And he really hasn't had that dominant season since 2021. And he was saying he expects JT to bounce back and be a monster. And obviously health is a factor in that. But I think overall, just having the offseason to be fully healthy, to be conditioned, to play with Anthony Richardson, because fun fact for you, they played two snaps together last year. Two. That's, That's it, which is mind-blowing to me because the same week that John Taylor got paid and came back off the pup list was the same week that Anthony yeah. got hurt, and it was that was it. And so I think after looking at the way they ended the season with Jonathan Taylor, I believe it was like 30 carries, 188 yards, and that yes. loss to the Texans, he looked like all-pro JT, and he's still only 25, so I would expect him to have a huge season if he can stay healthy, not only because of his talent, but because of what – Anthony can do as a dual threat quarterback. As we've seen, we've seen, you know, quarterbacks like obviously Lamar Jackson, you look at Jalen Hurts, even Josh Allen, they can have running backs who will have big seasons just because they're the quarterback and they're, you know, they have to account for their legs. So if you supercharge that with a player as good as Jonathan Taylor, I would expect him to crack a thousand yards pretty easy. Um, if he can stay healthy and be a really productive player. And at some point we're going to see it more often than not, probably, where you're going to pick your poison when they're doing a, an option play and you're going to guess wrong. And you're either going to get gassed by Anthony Richardson or you're going to get gassed by Jonathan Taylor, who to me is another freak athlete in this offense and 
you know, sometimes I look at him and I'm like, wow, like, you know, you're another one of God's favorites because <laughs> how are you that big? You can run that fast. And so um, I would also, you know, be on the lookout for him being used even on some of those check downs too and getting more involved in the passing game. First up, you just spoke the, the dy dynamic, I can speak, uh, that we hope uh, evolves in Baltimore this year. We want Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry to feed off. Exactly. You just described what everyone wants to happen in Baltimore. We want to happen in Indy. And, yeah, I mean, would we – would we be wrong or right to like fantasy managers read into the fact that the Colts didn't really add anyone by like, no offense to Evan Hall or no offense to mm -hmm. Trey Sermon, but people read into that too. Like they're cutting JT loose again this year. I mean, as long as he can stay healthy, I mean, again, not to be smirched those guys, but th there's not a Zach Moss this year, like an experienced veteran. I mean, not that Trey Sermon's not experienced, but you, uh, we've been reading yeah. into that, that. He doesn't have like a clear cut number two. Yeah, no, I think you're fair to say he's not experienced, Patrick, and that's not a shot at Trey Sermon at all, but he's been in the league, I believe, three years now, former third-round pick, but he's only rushed for just over 300 yards in his total in his career overall. So he hasn't played a, a ton in the NFL, and so when you look at who's behind JT, there isn't much there, and I think that obviously they're going to bank on some of these guys gaining some valuable experience this season, but the bulk of the carries will be from Jonathan Taylor, and I don't know if it'll be like super crazy where he's, you know, toting the rock you know, 24 times a game or 25 times a game or something like that, because you're going to have Anthony who will, in theory, get six to eight runs a game or something like that. But he's going to be the bell cow for this team. And he should be. He's a 25-year-old former rushing champ who's yes. in the prime of his career still. And you paid him. I'm like, you, yes. you pay the guy. You, you probably want to hand the ball off to the guy you paid as one of the top running backs in the league. After acting like for a year that like they weren't going to pay him, and then they did pay him. Uh, oh, my gosh. Don't even get me started. And that was <laughs> – I was in the barber chair when I got a text about that. So, um, yeah, I was telling my barber, like, hey, wait a second on my line, and I got to, you know, text some people and, and confirm this and get it out there. But uh, no worries this year. JT's paid. We're not counting how many times he smiles when he shows up for camp, what hoodie he's wearing. All the silly things we did last summer yes. is behind us. <laughs> We've almost got to get the, the Nashville Tennesseans and Nick Suss, but I, I just going to ask you one more kind of boilerplate question before we got to get out of here. And just who's the Colts skill player who maybe surprised you this spring? We, we know it's shorts. We know it's T-shirts. We know they're not hitting. But who, who's a Colts a skill guy who maybe surprised you this spring? I wouldn't say surprised, but don't sleep on Jelani Woods. He missed all of last year with some hamstring injuries. He was um, arguably the most athletic tight end or one of the most athletic tight ends ever drafted. He had a pretty good rookie season. Like I said, missed all of last year with some hamstring injuries. He had to revamp his body this offseason, new training, new body work, all of those things. But he's still a freak of nature, 6'7", tight end, huge guy. We know that Shane Steichen in the past has really liked to use tight ends in his offense. I think that he's a guy who could have a big year. And to me, I've projected him to be my tight end one for this Colts team, even though he didn't play last year because on paper – he can do everything you want him to do. He can block, he can run, he can get open. And obviously, like I said, you can't teach six, seven. So if you throw it up to him, good things happen. And I think that he is someone who flashed to me throughout the spring and, I, and got me thinking like, man, could this be a guy who, you know, sneaks in four or five touchdowns this season? Uh, James, just amazing stuff. Uh, tell our listeners, tell our viewers where they can find you other than the New York Times. I still say the athletic, but you know, you can't, you can upgrade yeah. it to New York Times anytime you want. I, I feel like I'm a big kid now. I don't know if I should put New York Times in my bio. I feel like that's <laughs> cheating, but no, you can check me out. Obviously at the athletic, at the New York Times, follow me on Twitter at Romeoville kid. Try to keep it fun for you all. Keep the videos coming. And um, that's one of the things that I do throughout camp is like a trolling video. It's like Anthony Richardson, proof of life. John Taylor, proof of life. So they know that they're out there and they're practicing. The fantasy people eat it up. They love it. And I know I'm going to get a bunch of, uh, you know, mentions and comments, Patrick, when I tweet out that Anthony Richardson had a great play to A.D. Mitchell. Someone's going to be oh, like, yeah. where's the video? Yep. But obviously we can't get video for everything. We, we will overinterpret every single thing you write and post. I appreciate um, that. <laughs> uh, James, thank you so much for the time. Check him out. Amazing stuff in the Colts. Uh, hopefully we talk to you next year. Sounds good. You have a good one, man. You too. James is gone. Uh, we'll be right back with Nick Suss from the Nashville Tennessean. The Roto World Draft Guide is back and it has a bit of a facelift, now available exclusively through a new partnership with Matthew Barry's Fantasy Life. Get a Fantasy Life Plus subscription and receive the Roto World Draft Guide to help you dominate your competition. Use promo code ROTOWORLD10 for 10% off and unlock extensive fantasy, DFS, and betting tools now. Go to NBCSports.com slash Fantasy Life to learn more. We are now joined by the Nashville Tennesseans, Nick Suss, and maybe the Rotor World Footballs, Kyle Dvorak. We are sorry for his technical difficulties. 
Uh, Nick, we're sorry to keep you waiting. Hopefully you learned a thing or two from James, though, if you're a fantasy player. And uh, we'll, we'll start with – that's what we asked James first. Um, Nick, do you actually play fantasy football? We're, we're sure you're all too aware of fantasy football and the people tweeting at you. Uh, I, do you actually play fantasy football? I started playing fantasy football in 2004. All right, all right. So and, you play. And <laughs> one of us, buddy, one of us. <laughs> and last year was the first year I did not play. Oh no! So, uh, so I did last year wean myself off, not out of anti-fantasy football bias, but out of I just don't enjoy the stress I put myself through. Yes, so I relate there, to pain, there. but I uh, uh, I weaned myself off the pain. Yeah, we might we might need to put that on Road World. Uh, do not wean yourself off of the pain. Uh, we need people playing fantasy football. Uh, we totally understand the stress as evidenced by the fact that we have a fantasy football podcast and exactly. we can never stop talking about fantasy and I can never stop talking about my other fantasy teams, by the way, including my baseball team, which I need a, a bigger second. <laughs> fantasy baseball is an entirely different level of stress, by the way. Uh, but so, you know, the deal with fantasy and you know that this year people are going to be wondering if this Titans offensive change is for real. You know, they, the Mike Vrabel fire and brimstone type football has basically been ripped up from the roots they're bringing in uh, a Sean McVay disciple by way of Cincinnati, not really a Sean McVay disciple, uh, but Brian Callahan can at least be traced back to that Rams system. Uh, but he's a Zach Taylor guy. He's basically made no secret about it. He's going about modernizing the offense. Going to be like a more sequenced in a more modern fashion, more pass heavy, You know, not like establish the run to then get to the pass. Uh, but you know, all this is with Will Levis under center who, was very physically impressive as a rookie, uh, statistically not as much, maybe decision-making not as much. And th th that's where in fantasy people are wondering, because, you know, Will Levis has said he expects more attempts. He, has, he said he even expects to get to throw on first down. Uh, and people are just wondering, like, how for real is this, like, building around Will Levis? Like, are, are we, like, sleeping on Mason Rudolph? And just how much of this is lip service and how much of this is real with the Titans' offensive reinvention? No, I mean, Will Levis is the Titans starting quarterback and, and Mason Rudolph is there because he's a really strong backup option. But but go into this offseason interpreting the idea. If you're drafting a Titans quarterback, you're drafting Will Levis. And we can talk all about how deep your league has to be before you want to consider drafting Will Levis as a safe QB1. I, Levis is a kind of guy that, look, it's really easy to tell who actually watched the games last year and who's stat sheet watching with Will Levis. And I'm not going to blame you if you didn't watch the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> they were a 6-11 and 11 football team that had virtually no fantasy impact. And if this is a fantasy show, I have to tell you guys, you didn't miss all that much. D-Hop was good at times, and obviously Derrick Henry is what he was. But uh, Levis was a guy who... I think he was hit or pressured on roughly 45% of his dropbacks last year. It was just an impossible sample. It was insane. It was insane the, to watch. The separation stats for the receivers were as low as any team in the league, and the pressure rate was as quick as any team in the league. So you really didn't build too much of a sample, but you can you can look at what he did in that game against Atlanta and the game against Miami when he actually had – time to show his skill and you saw an NFL quarterback. And I think obviously CJ Straddle moved the yardsticks on how good you're supposed to be as a rookie. But I think in the modern NFL as a rookie, if you prove, Hey, I belong, you've checked that box. Now he needs to do a lot more beyond proving he belongs. But if the question right now is, is Will Levis the Titans quarterback? Yes. Yes, he is. That's very good to hear. I mean, that's how, that's the assumption we were operating under. We've gotten used to this being very suspicious of coaches, though. And you're being, you know, kind of, why did they sign Mason Rudolph, who somehow had like by far the best stretch of his career to end last sure. season? Yeah, he absolutely did. So that, like, that caught grabbed some attention in the fantasy community. But we are operating under the assumption that it is Will Levis. We're operating under too, like what you said, the, the stat sheet didn't look good. Uh, but, but the frame, of course, was NFL ready on day one. The arm was, was stunning at times. Just absolutely stunning at times. And just what do you think his true ceiling might be in an offense that is more pass friendly? I mean, we know that they signed a running back. They have a very promising second year running back in Ty J Spears. We know it's not like the run is going away. Like what is like statistically or otherwise, what do you think is the ceiling in this new Titans offense this season? Ceiling. If he hits 4,000, he had a great year. I'd say 35 to 38 is probably the, 
the range, that was a good season. I, I think that when we talk about Callahan and the McVay tree, he's a distant, distant branch. Callahan. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, it was definitely, yeah. I'm trying to make it clear I was overselling that. Yeah, he, Callahan. He's on the tree somewhere. But. If we want to talk about his actual path to being a head coach, he got most of his start coaching on those Denver teams with Peyton Manning in the early 2010s. So that is more Adam Gase. So he's on the Gase tree. It's science. Which, which Zach Taylor was as well, right? I can't I, remember, but it, it sounds yeah. like the, the Adam Gase tree is sometimes shockingly yeah. large. Um, yeah. uh, so it's that. And then he spent time with Matt Stafford in Detroit. He spent time with Derek Carr in Oakland and then made his way to Cincinnati eventually with Joe Burrow. So you look at the quarterbacks he's played for. These are quarterbacks who have had free reign in their offense. And the thing that Callahan preaches is I don't have a scheme. I have quarterbacks. And he wants to tailor what his quarterbacks can do based on the offense. And he wants to base the offense tailored around what his quarterbacks can do. It's it's cohabitative, if that's a word. In, <laughs> in, it in is now way. if it wasn't before. Um, so I, I think that what you're going to see is – Pop on the Kentucky tape from 2021 compared to 2022. Look at what Will Levis was able to do with Liam Cohen as his offensive coordinator compared to what he did with Rick, Rich Scangarello. It's going to be a lot of the things that favor Will Levis, who, let's face it, for all of his talents, dating back to 2020, I believe he has had a different offensive coordinator every year. Man. One at Penn State, two at Kentucky, and now two with the Titans. That is a lot to learn. He has learned to pitch and ditch quite a bit of, I throw it this way, they give me a new scheme, I throw it this way. But this is, when we talk about quarterback friendly, it's not, oh, it's friendly because the receivers are going to be open. It's friendly because they're going to do what he wants to do and what he's capable of. And that's a lot on his shoulders, but it's also encouraging if you're buying stock in a young quarterback that they're going to build an offense around him. Building around what the quarterback does well is it sounds very simple, and yet even at the NFL level is still uh, yeah. something quite frequently. It is not done. Just real quick, too, with Will Levis and the skill set. Do you think that includes the legs, or not? Is he not really just going to be employed that way? I mean, he had nine rushing touchdowns the Liam Cohen year at Kentucky. Uh, far less of a rushing factor as a senior. We had because of the the way absurd NCAA bookkeeping. He actually had negative one hundred and seven rushing yards, which includes sacks. Um, do you think it includes the legs at all, or do they want that to be a part of his game in 2024? Let, let's also acknowledge that he played most of his last year at Kentucky with a broken toe. Yes. So yes. That, that's part of it. But he'll run. I think he is more of a situation calls for it runner than a, you guys were talking about Anthony Richardson a minute ago. Yes. He's not going to have those designed runs. No. But he is mobile and Look, if you guys want to pull up the highlights from last year in Miami, there is a play he made, I believe, in the second quarter where he just lowered his shoulder and went through Bradley Chubb. I believe I remember that. Yeah. I'm scared. He has the physicality to run, he has the physicality to move. But think about the Joe Burrow offense that Callahan helmed. Burrow's athletic, but. Burrow takes what the defense gives him. And if it's deep to Jamar Chase, it's deep. If it's underneath to Joe Mixon, it's underneath. And I'm not saying this is going to be a perfect one-for-one -one Cincinnati offense to Tennessee offense, but expect the passing game to be the emphasis. And so the passing game is the emphasis, of course. Uh, not, not a huge leap to make after, I think, maybe the single most stunning signing of free agency was the Titans landing Calvin Ridley when they still have DeAndre Hopkins and do you think there will be a true number one between Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins? Or is this sort of a pick your poison? It depends on the game plan. It depends on the week. How do you, how do you see things shaking out? You know, between a guy who's definitely on the downslope of his career and DeAndre Hopkins, but still very effective, and a guy in Calvin Ridley who's had some career momentum in the past, but has been stop and start. People complained about the way he was used last year. How do you see things shaking out atop uh, the Titans' uh, depth, uh, receiver depth chart? I can start off by telling you there is one person on earth who really does not think DeAndre Hopkins is on the downslope of his career, and that is DeAndre Hopkins. He is still confident he's the guy he was five, six years ago. And look, last year in an offense where every single defensive coordinator knew they could put three guys on DeAndre Hopkins and the Titans would still throw to him, he still put up 1,000 yards. He was still a very strong season, he is, yes. He is still, if he's a number two option, he is still a really good number two option. 
I think this is a 1A, 1B situation. Calvin Ridley has obviously less tread on his tires, so that's going to be important. But I do think that, again, you look at the places Callahan's been, particularly Denver and Cincinnati, there has always been a strong use the number one and number two receivers fairly interchangeably. Uh, I would not be shocked if 17 games this year, DeAndre's the leading receiver five times, Ridley's the leading receiver five times, and then you have change uh, six, six each or whatever it is. I do think that they're both going to hover around that 950 to 1050 range that kind of you'd expect from guys of their caliber. Maybe Ridley can go a little bit higher. The question is really going to be who scores the touchdowns from a fantasy perspective because they'll put up the yards, but I, I you kind of have to assume DeAndre is more of a threat in the end yes. zone, which from a fantasy perspective, DeAndre still might be the more valuable one, but you also have Tyler Boyd who's going to run all the slot routes that he can be the threat uh, in the red zone too. And we can talk about the running backs a lot more later. I sure you, I'm assuming. We will. We will. Yes. And they're going to vulture some of those too, the way that that Cincinnati offense factors running backs into the check down. So from a fantasy perspective, I might have DeAndre a slight nudge ahead of Ridley, but I do think that they're going to be fairly uh, even when it comes to usage. As you kind of just elliptically referenced, like basically the dog levels with DeAndre Hopkins are maybe a good tiebreaker in the red zone and the touchdowns <laughs> and in fantasy. But we have a usage question with Calvin Ridley because it just drove fantasy managers crazy that the Jaguars did not move Calvin Ridley around the formation more last season. I think infamously, he, he, we, fantasy people were just calling, he's got to run more in-breaking routes. He's got to have more easy stuff over the middle of the field. Is it safe to assume Brian Callahan will be more creative with Calvin Ridley's usage? We, they do have the ultimate slot man and Tyler Boyd now, so Calvin will be on the outside a lot. But what kind of sense of his usage do you get with Calvin Ridley, and will he be moved around the formation maybe more in 2024? I'll give you the good news, bad news here. The good news, um, he's going to be moved around. He, he definitely will. Um, I think that all three of these receivers are going to spend time in the slot at points, and Traylon Burks, if he is somebody that can be counted upon at some point, will also be in that mix. The bad news is the Titans offense coordinator, and this isn't even bad news, it's just the thing that you'll stick out in your head as a fantasy manager, was the Jaguars passing game coordinator last year. So it's it's not as if that influence isn't going to be there too. So I think it's going to be schematically much more similar to Cincinnati than it was Jacksonville. But oh, we do yeah. have to acknowledge that Calvin Ridley does have some familiar faces around him. And we can talk about, oh, Calvin Ridley disappointed last year, this, that. He had 1,000 yards in his first year back after missing 18 months. Yes. Of yes. That is the thing that if we are projecting the last time that Calvin Ridley actually played 16, 17 games in a season, he was a top six receiver in football. He was a second team all pro. I don't know if that translated exactly to fantasy points. It did. It, it was a humongous fantasy season. He is a guy who can be counted on. And it would not shock me in the slightest if he ended up with 1,300, 1,400 yards. I'm still tempering it a little bit because I haven't seen the offense in practice other than a couple of drives here in minicamp. But like, I do think that he could return to that 2018, 2019 form if everything goes right. You do make the the, the the very good point that disappointment is relative in fantasy. Yeah, 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns, uh, and a year where the NFL valued it at $92 million. So exactly. uh, the NFL did not find it disappointing. Uh, you referenced the third pass catcher, by the way. Is it to set and forget Tyler Boyd, or is it maybe Chega Conquo, who was super efficient in 2022, then didn't compile nearly as much last year? Is it one of the running backs? Who would you call the number three passing game weapon in this offense right now? If we are talking about total number of catches, I would pick Tajay Spears. My wow. guess is that Tajay will be, because what did he have? 52 catches last year in an offense that did not pass the ball nearly as much no. as this offense. And I know he was essentially a third down player last year. Uh, it's going to be different this year with a 1A, 1B situation with him and Pollard and I don't want to get ahead of myself on Pollard, but we know functionally how good he is at 15 touches a game versus 25 touches a game. And if the Titans can keep Pollard around that 15 touch mark and give Tajay 10 to 12, I wouldn't be shocked if roughly half of 
Hajj's touches end up being from the passing game. He proved himself really valuable there. Uh, if we're talking about yards and touchdowns, obviously Tyler Boyd will have more opportunities to go further down the field and let's not underrate the guy. Like he has been as strong of a number three option as the NFL has had in the last five years in this exact scheme. So I don't expect much fall off here. I, I do think that obviously Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase is going to garner a little bit more attention than <laughs> Will Calvin Ridley at first, but I do think that Tyler Boyd is going to be, if we're hovering around that 650, 750 yard mark that he tends to be as a number three receiver, that's, that's solid. It, you're right. Tyler Boyd is basically copyrighted the number three receiver position. Like yeah. he, he, he is what I think of when I think of like the platonic ideal of a number three receiver, but you get to maybe the single biggest fantasy question about this offense, even more than what to expect from Will Levis. And that is with the backfield. I feel like every time we got a quote about this backfield, either from the coaching staff or the Titans media, the coaching staff was really talking up. He used the word at one point, Brian Callahan, or maybe it was the, the running backs coach. Someone's said interchangeability with Tony Pollard and Ty J Spears. They're talking about basically he's like, guys, they can both play all three downs. They can both be on the field in any situation, uh, which is really good for real life football, but potentially really bad for predicting fantasy football. They're both guys. Tony Pollard has an early down resume, but they're both guys who've done their best work really on third downs. And how do you expect this is uses to shake out? Like you said, uh, Ty J Spears and an offense that had really never even featured a number two back with Derrick Henry caught 52 passes last year. Uh, Tony Pollard did amazing work on third downs in 2022 uh, before he's kind of, he never got it really over, came back all the way from that injury in 2023 that he suffered in the 2022 playoffs. Just how do you expect things to shake out? And we, we, you could just be guessing here. It's July 17th. We haven't had training camp yet. We haven't had pads on yet, but just how do you expect things to shake out between Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears? Before I answer this, how dorky does this audience skew? Do you want me to get real numerical here? Oh, yeah, yeah this it skews quite dorky. So, okay. yes, you can. <laughs> so here's, here is something I wrote in March when this signing happened. Three numbers each, three players each. Derrick Henry, 2021 to 2023. 22.6 touches per game, 4.8 yards per touch, 107.5 scrimmage yards per game. Pretty Tony good. Pollard, 21 to 23. 14.8 touches per game, 5.3 yards per touch, 78.1 scrimmage yards per game. Joe Mixon in that time, 19.4 touches per game, 4.6 yards per touch, 89 scrimmage per game. We'll do the algebra here. You're trying to replicate Henry's 107.5 scrimmage yards per game. You know Pollard is at 5.3 yards per touch, and you know Mixon's usage rate was 19.4 per game. Take Pollard's yards by Mixon's touches, and that's 102.8 yards per game, just five yards below what Henry was averaging at the absolute prime of what could, have, what could end up being a Hall of Fame career. By that logic, and that logic alone, if you use Tony Pollard in the way the Bengals used Joe Mixon, and he does not suffer. Tony Pollard could end up, could end up being a 100 yards from scrimmage a game guy. And that's what you're looking for. But also, as I alluded to before, we understand the dip for Pollard. He was averaging 13 touches a game in 21-22. He went up to 18 touches a game last year, and his yards per touch dropped by about a yard and a half. So if we're hovering around 13 as his optimal number of touches, that really means you only have to give Tajay six, seven touches a game to get to that mix in number of 19 and a half. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think Pollard's going to be touching 12 to 15 times a game. Spears is going to be touching 12 to 15 times a game. So if you transmute that math once again, bear with me. Tajay had five and a half yards per touch last year, averaging about nine touches a game. If you give him 12 a game, that works out to 66 yards a game. Pollard at 13 touches a game, 6.1 yards per touch, that's 79 yards a game, and the Titans end up averaging 145 scrimmage yards per game from running backs. That's way more than they got from Derrick Henry in his 2,000-yard season. There is a potential here for this Titans running back room to be remarkably productive. 
but that does not help fantasy players at all. No, no. <laughs> so <laughs> that is a roundabout way of saying the math supports, if you're trusting either of these guys as a situational RB2 against a team that is susceptible to running back play, you got a really good shot of one of them having a good day. But you also have a really good shot of the other one having a good day. And it's going to be kind of tricky to pick because it's not like ground and pound. This isn't Chris Johnson no. and White anymore. This is two guys who do things essentially the same way. And the Titans are going to get to run their offense at full speed. I think about not to diversion here, but I used to cover Lane Kiffin's teams when he, when I covered colleges. And I think about the way he handles running backs of just like get four of the same guy run 85 yes. in the game and you never have to change your offense. This is the NFL equivalent of that. You have not clones of each other, but Tajay says when he was in the NFL draft, the player comp that the NFL draft gave him was Tony Pollard. Like That's this crazy. is what the league sees. So it's going to be tough to discern. You can't discern. Fantasy managers can't discern. Their ADPs are seriously almost identical. Pollard, RB29, Tajay Spears, RB, RB31. They're only eight picks apart. I submit, they're not even anything. Can we not even say something like, well, it's a new brain trust that paid Tony Pollard in free agency. So maybe tie break in favor of him. It doesn't even seem like, it seems like they do genuinely like Ty J Spears. Same front office that like Ty J Spears, that drafted Ty J Spears too. So yeah. it just seems like maybe we get, we just got to wait to see how this, it's one of those situations where as much as we try to find a tea leaf to read, we're just not going to find it for the actual games start getting played. Yeah. And I think unfortunately for you guys, once the games start, I don't know if you're going to get much clarity. <laughs> yeah. There, sometimes there are situations where week 14 and we're still waiting for clarity. And yeah. it just never comes. And this does seem set up to be one of those. We almost have to get Mr. John Shipley in here. He's been waiting patiently. Uh, but I cannot let you out of here without – I ask everyone this is kind of a final question. It's a boilerplate final question. But who's a Titan skill player who maybe surprised you this spring? It, it could be one of the star players. Does someone who's surprised you in one way or another – we know there's not pads on, uh, and it's just they're, they're kind of just getting the lay of the land and the new offense. But who maybe surprised you? from a skill player perspective this spring? That is going to actually make a fantasy impact. Probably nobody. But I I will say, if you, if you have a very deep league and you're trying for a boomer bust, people are still raving about Traylon Burks' ability. Oof, wow. We've, we've been suckered into it two years in a row. It's true. I do think that injuries and mental stuff have factored in a lot more than talent. There's a lot more people around him now, which makes it kind of tougher to project him. Oh, can he be a number one or number two receiver? But I'm out there at practice every day. I'm watching him run. I'm watching him catch passes. I'm not 100% convinced that he is done as a real life NFL receiver option yet. So give him a shot. And if not him, uh, don't be surprised if you think about Josh Wiley as the Titans tight end even with Chig this year. I don't think it's a Chig number one, Josh number two situation. I think they're going to be 1A, 1B. So if you uh, you need a situational tight end this year, he might be a, a nice red zone option as like a six foot six, six foot. I was going to say Josh Wiley, one of the largest humans. Very, very, very tall and might steal you a touchdown or two in the red zone uh, when you need him. Maybe what you just said, by the way, with Traylon Burks, uh, Maybe he'll be like a, a late camp trade candidate and they can actually still get, maybe when someone's desperate, they could get a fifth round pick for Traylon Burks Always late in fine. training camp or something. Uh, so, uh, hey, listen, just when we thought we were out, we're ever so vaguely back in on Traylon Burks. And uh, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time. We know that like the summer is essentially over for you guys, the beat writers, and that yeah, you are signing your life away to the NFL for the next six months. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, tell our audience where they can find you on Twitter, uh, and I have said the Nashville, Tennessee in a few times, but uh, where, where can our, our, our listeners and viewers find you? Yeah, go to Tennessean.com so I can get paid uh, <laughs> and go to Twitter where I don't get paid. Yep. Uh, I, I don't have to do as much as I used to. I'm sorry about that. I uh, I kind of lost lost faith in the brand. I'm a dead ender. I'll be there to the bitter end. I'm, I'm there. I'm lurking. I'm absolutely <laughs> lurking. But as I see my likes go down and down and yeah. down and down, I'm just like, I, I don't know how much I'm getting out of this. But yeah, read the stuff of Tennessee. And, and if you live in Nashville, uh, just find me. I'm here. Find Mr. Nick Suss in Nashville. Find him 
uh, on this preview show. Awesome stuff, Nick. Thank you so much for taking the time. And yeah, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, happy to be here, y'all. Thanks. And we'll catch up with John Shipley uh, right after this. For the 10th time in history, Royal Troon hosts the world's best golfers who are competing for the Championship Golfer of the Year. It's the only major where victory is best served out of a jug. The 152nd Open, Thursday through Sunday on NBC, USA Network, and streaming on Peacock. We are now joined, um, I think, so like, you know, they used to make a big deal about how many times people hosted SNL. Uh, I think John <laughs> is the first three-timer. On our, there we go. On our, our beat writer interview series as we get ready to preview the upcoming seasons. There's only one guy to ask on the Jacksonville Jaguars, in my opinion. And it's Mr. John Shipley, who, who has seen some stuff yeah. on this Jags beat. And yeah. you're still seeing stuff. It's better than it used to be. But it's it, still it, very it, jaguars it, it is. It's like the quality of how dumb they can be is still around there. But the frequency has at least gone down. I, I, I will say that. There was like that 2020 to 2021 span. It was like neck break speed. I was I was getting whip, whiplash. I still have like non flashbacks about it. But we're we're moving forward. We're all good. We are moving forward. Yeah, we're everyone's just got to move forward from the Urban Meyer yeah. and everyone's got to move forward from the Calvin Ridley. By the way, we're just even though that was not even a disappointing season, we were just breaking that down with Nick Suss. It was maybe just disappointing in fantasy. By the way, John, real quick, I feel like you're a college football tweeter. Am, am I wrong about this? Uh, you're like a uh, I tweet, about wanna... UCF. I tweet about UCF a lot because I'm That's what severely, I yeah, I'm severely in debt to them. So I could end up covering Urban Meyer and be a three-time <laughs> guest <laughs> on here. So I tweet about UCF, their rival, quote-unquote, because I don't think UCF is qualified enough to have a rival. USF, that's mostly just to rile people up. A lot of USF fans are Jags fans, so I just try to poke fun at them. And well, it's not a rivalry. US, UCF wins that game essentially every time it's played. Exactly the the war the war on I four the worst highway in America. So that <laughs> the I, worst I, highway in America. Outside of them, not as much. Especially like before I started covering the league, I did. But since then, like during the NFL season, I'm so like locked into the NFL. If you had told me which state is the worst interstate in America, by the way, I would have guessed Florida easily <laughs> yeah. without knowing anything. That's even brutal. about them, but yeah, that was going to be my long way of asking uh, if you were going to play NCA twenty five. Oh, uh, I've I've already I've already started playing. You've already got it. You paid. Oh, yeah. You paid oh, yeah. the man. I, I'm I'm gonna try to turn it into some some kind of content so I can try to write it off some way and have Uncle Sam, you know, try try to look out for it. Maybe ask. I, I don't even know, like Jaguars players, what they think about it if they bought it. I, 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 I'm going to turn this into work somehow because it's definitely, if not, it's definitely going to get me fired. The, the players are already tweeting about it, so I'm assuming yeah. there's got to be Jags out there playing it. Uh, um, see, see, seeing like ex NFL players who like didn't work out, like make themselves characters and say they're like <laughs> they committed. It's like the yeah. saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it's a, it's a, there, there's going to be a content gold mine from NCAA. There hopefully. Is. Uh, you're a part of that. You're a content gold mine on the Jags. Uh, we love your stuff. So we, we got to ask you the big question uh, that starts um, in the Jaguars receiver. We're actually I should maybe start with Trevor Lawrence. Um, but yeah, I'll start with Trevor Lawrence, uh, who That's is it. the latest. Is he still the highest paid player in NFL history? Or has someone moved past him? Um, I think I'm pretty currently- sure it's. I'm pretty sure it's still him. Like him. I don't think anybody's been paid since he was like what was it, like three weeks ago, four yeah, weeks like, ago, something like that. Someone will be. But yeah, Trevor Lawrence is the the latest highest played highest paid player in the history of the NFL. Uh, we can quibble all we want about whether or not it's deserving. We know he was deserving of a of, of a long term contract extension, and this is just how the game is played. A quarterback, when you're up, you get the biggest deal ever. Uh, but is it safe to say that obviously this signals uh, absolute belief from the Jaguars, and are they're still all the way in on Trevor Lawrence? Is there any other way to read that, or is there? Any 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 doubt at all in the Jags' minds about Trevor Lawrence being the guy? No, I don't think there's any doubt. I I don't think there's any doubt. I think that they are in. I think they're in to an extent because like they have to be. Yes. Like, Trevor, of course, hasn't been the perfect quarterback. He hasn't been quote unquote generational, you know, at all. I'm not. I I should know this. I'm not sure he's thrown 30 touchdown passes in a season. In fact, I'm pretty I'm pretty positive. He is that not. He has. I- I was yeah, recently in a humongous argument about Trevor Lawrence on this very podcast. That you see, I promised myself entering this offseason because I figured he was going to get paid. I was going to do my best to take a step back from the discourse. And the day he got paid, I said I would tweet the article and then just step away from my computer. I, I, I managed to do close to that, but not quite that. But 
I, I think they definitely, you know, have faith in him. Like I said, to an extent, they kind of have to. It's kind of like Jared Goff getting paid by the Lions to an extent. Like, not comparing them as players, but maybe the situation is like, they can't not pay him, you know, considering especially like their history as a team success yes. uh, for the Jaguars more so than the lions, their history at the quarterback position, like even a below expectations, Trevor Lawrence is arguably like, well, not even arguably is the second best quarterback in franchise history. And while going nine and eight in back-to-back seasons is, you know, pretty mediocre for most franchises, the Jaguars are not most franchises. <laughs> That's basically a pat on the back to them. They've have said that okay, that it's time to stop congratulating ourselves for being mediocre. So it looks like now they're finally moving past that. But I, I do think that you know they have belief. I, I think that you can definitely say at times last year they were probably frustrated. Like they want to just like grab him and shake him sometimes. Yes. Like what 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 were you doing? Like that's the experience watching him sometimes because you see him make all the throws. Uh, he really feels like a rhythm guy. Like once he gets hot, like you normally tell at the start of a game how he's going to play. If he starts out rough, he normally stays rough. If he starts out hot, you know, he stays hot. But I think they also see him as – it's a cliche, but, like, Blaine Gabbert was 25 years old for, like, eight years. But I do really do think they see him as – he's still relatively young in terms of playing the position. Uh, I, I think an underrated thing coming out of Clemson was he basically learned zero about playing NFL quarterback at Clemson. Didn't learn that much his rookie year. So it definitely is excuse building, but there is some merit to the point of he's still relatively young in terms of on field NFL experience. I was, I, you gave me a perfect segue, but I had, had to circle back to a joke that uh, you said it's the second best quarterback in Jags franchise history. He's like, oh, wow. So you, you still think Blake Bortles is better hot now? You meant Mark. <laughs> <laughs> the, <meant> Mark. <laughs> the, the, the love affair with Blake Bortles still within the Jaguars <laughs> fan base. You have, you have, to, you have to tread water. Like, I, I will, like his name will come up when I talk about like worst contracts or worst picture. Or <laughs> or like, no, man, he's like the boat or whatever. And I'm like, no, gr- grow up. I think I said on um, uh, my podcast with Jags SI, I think I told people like, if you want to be entertained, just go get a dog. Like he's not, not an NFL quarterback, man. Let's go get a golden receiver. Blake Bortles, by the way, only 32 years old. I just confirmed that. Like talk about like a stunning, you said, uh, Blaine Gabbert was 25 for eight years. Blake Bortles has been 32 for 14 years. Um, Blake Bortles was legitimately a number three overall pick. And then like five years later was on the open market for any team to sign. And he was with the Rams for like a year. He did. He and got after, one year in McVay finishing school. Yeah. And I think he was with the Packers for like a week. And after that, the NFL completely <laughs> lost interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that like shows what kind of pick that, that was. Like, show. Normally like, like he didn't even get like the Zach Wilson like we have treatment. <laughs> yeah, you know the cursory like yeah. yeah. Like, listen, listen, we won't just usher out the door quite like that. Like this is the NFL. We're a dignified organization. We'll give you one fake contract on the way out. The yeah, door. exactly. <laughs> uh, that did not happen for Blake Bortles. You mentioned the excuse making with Trevor Lawrence. That was a question I wanted to ask you. Where so after he got signed, you know, all the debates broke out that you did your best not to take part in. That I utterly <laughs> failed at not taking part in. I was. <laughs> quite literally screaming at Kyle Dvorak on the show. (laughs) Kyle was supposed to be here and he's having technical difficulties. uh, So he would have loved to be here for this part. Uh, But yeah, it went viral like two or three different like clip compilations of like drops from Trevor Lawrence's receivers. And I was like, I don't know, man, a lot of these look like they'd be pretty difficult catches. Yeah. Uh, Where are you on that narrative? Like, is he let down by supporting cast or is this more like a Trevor Lawrence problem? You kind of answered it where you said he's like a rhythm guy. He runs hot and cold. Where are you on that, like that part of like the Trevor Lawrence flame war? Like it's all the drops, it's all the receivers. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a little bit of everybody. I think when you have that many miscues, I think it has to be on everybody. Yeah, especially like last year when there was even some like the, the offensive coordinator was having to answer questions of receivers running the right routes, guys or so like out of sync, out of sync with each other. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, like even literally got hurt because of a miscommunication, like on a route and stuff like that. It's kind of signified the Jaguars offense last year, but it's definitely part of him too. Like he definitely throws some passes that are, you know, dead on arrival. Uh, like I said, the inconsistency is the biggest thing he needs to clear up, especially in the red zone. He's never been a great like touch passer in the red zone. And no, I think jo- Josh Norris says he, he would have had like what, six more touchdowns at the field was like 
a foot yard like longer. <laughs> and it's it, true. Like you watch those compilations, and there's so many plays of guys in the. They're back always at the, the back of the end zone. They get like fingertips on it, and then people yeah. like blame the receiver. Like I don't know, man. He probably should have just put it more on his hand. Yeah. So I I definitely think it's a little bit of both, but I also think like. I don't know. Look at some of the other like teams that are starting from scratch at quarterback and some of the weapons they provide. Like uh, objectively, Zay Jones, you know, just efficiency wise, you look at his numbers. Two years of the Jaguars, he got fed targets, and he was one of like the least efficient, least reliable receivers. I think that there's some merit to that. That at times he's been let down by supporting cash, just because I think that they've overpaid for some guys to be better than they truly are. Uh, Christian Kirk's like a solid player, but you're paying him to be a receiver number one. And he's, you know, no team's receiver number one. Uh, Calvin Ridley, you know, is probably best as a number two, but last year they had to feed him as a number one. Just things like that. So I definitely think it's a little bit of both. I think if anybody blames wholly one side, it's probably the wrong take. But I, I think it's definitely fair to say both both sides have some blood in their hands with how messed up things were in the passing game last year. So yeah, we're we're talking about the Jags receiver core. That's where like the big offseason change change, at least in the skill group, was where Calvin Ridley's gone. Gabe Davis is you mentioned them overpaying receivers. Gabe Davis has been signed. Yeah. And you know, say what you will, but they clearly they have a role in mind for Gabe. We know yeah. we won't debate the the talent or skill level of Gabe Davis. Brian Thomas was a first round pick. Would I, would I be correct in saying maybe this is not as talented as a receiver core as it was last year, just by sheer virtue, maybe of no Calvin Ridley, but maybe a better designed one where you have Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas threatening on the boundary. You have Kirk maybe getting to do more inside. You have an Evan Ingram dominating over the middle of the field. What are your thoughts on the construction of this receiver core? It's what the fourth year of Lawrence's career. And this is the first like pass catching room that's actually made sense. Like yes. for him and his skill set. Like when they went out and signed Zay Jones and Christian Kirk, it was like, all right, it felt like they had to sign somebody, but neither one of them really felt like a fit with Lawrence. I feel like Lawrence's like fit with Kirk has gotten obviously, you know, better and better since they've been together. But him and a receiver like Zay Jones, like Marvin Jones in 2022, just never really made much sense because Lawrence is best at, you know, really pushing the ball downfield and giving guys a chance to get it. The only deep threats he's had in his career are, you know, DJ Chark for like four games, uh, the ghost of Laquan Treadwell, who since like being like 30 in receiving yards on the Jaguars, hasn't even like played another regular season game since then. And then they they basically used Calvin Ridley as a vertical threat last year. That's obviously not his game. No. I, I felt like signing Gabe Davis was kind of a signal to be like, okay, we know this wasn't Ridley's game because no matter what kind of cope Jaguars fans want to have about Ridley, and I've never seen them cope harder over a situation. Than, like, like he's literally he's engaging. a lot, by the way, because there, there's been some Jags coping. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's been some copium. They, they engage with him on Twitter once a week, and he engages like, like right back with them. I'm like, oh, he, he will tweet back at you if you, you know, reply Let to him. Let it go. Yeah, you don't but, want the smoke. But the Jaguars literally wanted to pair Gabe Davis with Calvin Ridley. Yeah, like, I know the, like, semi-casual take when they signed Gabe Davis, it was like, oh, they think they're losing Calvin Ridley. No, they at that moment, they thought they were bringing the men together. They didn't know they were losing Calvin Ridley until, like, two days later when the Titans came in last minute. So I think they obviously wanted to move Ridley out of that role and find, like, a true X to just plant on the line of scrimmage, win vertically, uh, be a blocker, be that physical player. And then, obviously, you know, with Ridley, it didn't work out. But with Thomas, he's a guy who – you know, I think will obviously take like that Z spot in the offense where I think Ridley would have played, but he's a much different player than Ridley. Uh, he, he has a really unique, you know, athletic profile, stream profile. Yeah. A profile that would make sense with a guy like Trevor Lawrence. I mean, Trevor Lawrence has shown in the past, you know, he can win with players who are like him, but there just aren't many players like Thomas in the NFL. Uh, I, I know. I think the low end comp I've had for him is, ah, uh, Man, why, why do I not have it off the top of my head? Uh, size, Marquez, yeah, size it, speed freak. MVS. That that's my like low end comp. If things don't work out, is he MVS or is he? You know, obviously not DK because I, I think was gonna say like, is he DK? No, I mean that's who does come to mind. Like exactly, like, it, size speed freak. Exactly. So I, like to me, he's either he's gonna struggle or he's gonna be like one of the pieces to unlock the Jaguars' offense. But I do think just in terms of like skill skill fit and you know, what they can potentially do with Lawrence. I do think this room makes more sense than even last year's did. 
By the way, the odds are high. One of these guys will be MVS at least this year. I feel like there, there might be an MVS. So you, that's why you take two shots. One exactly. Of them, one of them won't be MVS. <laughs> there's and, an MVS on every roster. <laughs> there's an MVS in every heart. Uh, so like, uh, this is probably an impossible answer question, but in this new look receiver room, this is fantasy. We'll try to make you like put a number on it. Maybe. For sure. Who leads the team in catch? Is it Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram? And then these other guys are distant three, four, like, who has the most fantasy points this year? Because Christian yeah. Kirk, not the most explosive guy. We we know he'll win like the raw PPR war, but like who who leads in production? Who leads in fantasy? Points? Yeah, I, I think Christian Kirk's going to remain like the number one target. Uh, him and Lawrence just have basically like a brain blend at this point. Like they've been able to get so on the same page over the last two years. When you know, obviously Lawrence's injuries were the big story out of Jacksonville in the last month of the season last year. But it's really when Kirk got hurt against the Bengals when the offense kind of fell apart because he so often is Lawrence's safety valve. Plus just the style of offense that Doug Peterson runs, you know, slot receivers over the middle are going to, you know, get fed the ball quite a bit. So I think he's going to lead the team in targets. I think Evan Ingram is going to be behind him. Whether those targets are three yards downfield every time like they were last year. not really he saying he wants deeper targets? Yeah, he did. It, if you go back to the 2022 season, they threw him more like vertical passes of the team. And even in week one, he caught like a 25 yard pass where he lined up at receiver and just ran a go route. And then they just decided to stop doing it. I, I think they like were overcompensating for how bad the offensive line was. They were just trying to literally try not to have Trevor Lawrence even think, just get the ball and give it to Evan Ingram. And then behind them, I think Brian Thomas and Gabe Davis, I, I don't know. You could go either way. I think they're going to be third and fourth in terms of targets. I think you probably see Gabe Davis get a little more, especially early on, because he's seen these coverages in the NFL. He's a lot more experienced than Thomas is coming out. You know, Thomas, for all the gifts he has, is, you know, he's relatively raw in terms of LSU really didn't ask him to do much. And he also didn't see much in terms of the defenses that he was seeing in college compared to what he'll see now. So my guess is Gabe Davis is third in targets. Didn't you see Brian Thomas at fourth? But for both Gabe Davis and Thomas, like, their targets might be even more valuable than what Kirk and Ingram see because it, 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 I think it's clear that Kirk and Ingram are going to do like the dirty work of the passing game and, you know, try to move the chains. Whereas the outside guys are going to be the ones they try to stretch the field with. With, with Brian Thomas, uh, you made just a lot, there's a lot of interesting points that can be made with Brian Thomas where like just like awe inspiring deep game at LSU. But the reason you just laid out, I mean, that could be shut down immediately in the NFL, like at least as a rookie, as he gets used like the speed and coverages he's going to see. What would you think is like a fair over under for his receiving yards? Like 550, 750. Like, I, what's a good over under? Where to like even set the line on Brian? I'll go Thomas. like 575 because, like I said, I think the targets he does see will be valuable. And the big thing with him is like, unlike some other receivers of like kind of his archetype, is he'll be playing right away. You know, like he won't be sitting like yes. on the bench and developing to an extent. Like he's going to be a week one starter. So like ready or not, he's going to be on the field. And I think when they get in the red zone, he might get some design looks, you know, slot fades, back shoulder throws, stuff like that, just because of his size. So I think those two things might help him early on. But I think 575, maybe 600 yards sounds about right. Uh, well, 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 we're getting near the end here. By the way, our producer Adam said the DraftKings line, the over under, is 750. So they are Ooh. setting out. They're a little more optimistic than you, John. I don't know about that. What's that? And, and by the way, this is another thing we had to ask with the receiver core. Uh, do, do we sense that are they going to force the issue with like trying to get more explosive plays? Because that's certainly what it seems like when you add outside guys like Gabe Davis and I, Ryan Thomas. I think to an extent, but it's also connected and tied. I think to their offensive line. Like if if you ask people on the Jaguars staff last year, they would tell you that, you know, we tried to generate explosive plays. We just couldn't get the ball pushed downfield. Offensive line couldn't hold up. And the only real change they made along the offensive line was swapping out Luke Fortner for Mitch Morris. And Mitch Morris is a solid NFL center, but it's not like they're, you know, bringing in a Hall of Fame center or anything like that. Hey, I'm a zoo Hall of Famer. But yeah, <laughs> fair enough. So, uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt your train of thought. No, you're good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll end with the backfield where the Jags – or I might end with one more boilerplate question, by the way. Uh, but the Jags are once again – they're putting a brave face on the situation and insisting <laughs> they would like to get Tank Bigsby more involved, that they don't want Travis Etienne handling so many touches. And they kind of did actually uh, fulfill that. Travis Etienne finished the season very poorly. I think like some random guys were getting touches near the end of that. But not really Tank Bigsby because he was just bad. 
um, really bad ball security in like his hands. You yourself reported this spring that he quote did not have a standout off season. And is it just gonna be more of the every down same for Travis Etienne? And how do you see things going with this backfield? So that's the thing. Like with Tank Bigsby last year, I have like if you look back at it now with the context of how Tank season went, I could be utterly destroyed. Because like Tank Bigsby legitimately had a good training camp in like OTAs last year. I've even I've, like asked other members of the beat. I was like, I wasn't like crazy, right? Like <laughs> you saw that too. And he was, he was one of like the standout guys for them throughout training camp at times and throughout OTAs. And then it just seemed like once the regular season started. All those turnovers when he first got on the field, he had like three turnovers on like his first like, like first like four or five games, something like that. It just seemed like that one hit his confidence and probably more importantly, hit their confidence in him. You know, they legitimately didn't want him to even be there in garbage time because yeah. they were worried he was crazy. about exactly. So and when the coaching staff doesn't have any trust in you, it's hard to get on the field. So I think he has to show them that he can hold on to the ball and show them that last year was more bad luck than it is just him as a player. I didn't think like you know this spring he was somebody who really overly stood out to me uh there were and mind you we see probably like 35 40 percent of the ota practices so you know he 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 could be ladanian tomlinson in the practices i don't see in terms of catching <laughs> yeah. he, he he very well could be but in the ones i saw he struggled with you know with hands on more than a couple occasions so i think it is going to be travis Etienne as an every down guy i think that at the start of the season They'll try to get Tank some rhythm and try to give him some like, confidence because I really do like, you know, they're telling you that they don't want Travis Etienne to be taking the beating that he did last year. You know, he ended the year injured. And he, you know, his yards per carry dipped a good bit. You know, it, it felt like, like they were dragging his body across the finish line by the end of the season. And, and he was third in touches and barely got to a thousand yards rushing. How beat up ex- he was. It, it, exactly. So it definitely seems like that's not what they want. So they desperately hope that Tank Bigsby can take something off of him. And so I think just because of that, he'll get a chance to. But I don't think he's going to have a very long leash either. I think if he struggles, that they won't hesitate to put like Dearness Johnson in there to get like five or six carries a game. I was going to say, is Dearness Johnson plan C? He seems like the only real viable plan C. I, I think he's plan C, but I don't think that they would like wait long to go to him, if that makes sense. And so to put a fine point on it, Travis Etienne, 325 touches last year. I mean, pretty insane in the modern NFL, especially for a player like Travis Etienne, who was never really designed to be that player. His you think foot he, like snapped in half like two years ago. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think he gets to 300 touches again? O- only six guys got to 300 touches last year. Do you think Travis Etienne gets to 300 touches this year? I think so, just because in terms of like – playmakers the ball in their hands he's probably number one on the jaguars he was probably their offensive mvp last year even with like the bad final stretch and the bad offensive efficiency i think chances are greater than not the tank Bigsby probably just isn't that great of an nfl back and they probably lean on etn again because you know they're very well you know depending on how things go could be a lot of pressure on doug peterson to win this season and i think he'll put that you know first and foremost John, quickly, I've taken enough of your time already, but real quick, who is someone in Jags offseason practice? We know it's the shorts. We know it's T-shirts. There's no pads. You just reference stuff. You only see about half the practices. Who was a surprising Jags skill player uh, for better or worse? Like, who was someone who surprised you this spring? So, Parker Washington looked really good. You know, six-round rookie last year. He was the aforementioned rookie who kind of got Trevor Lawrence hurt by running a wrong route last year. Like, there were obvious rookie moments with him, but – it, he he was such like an odd rookie coming out because he came out of the draft injured. That's why he slid to the sixth round. He probably, if fully healthy at the end of his run at Penn State, probably is a fourth, fifth round pick. Uh, he comes into Jacksonville, doesn't play until week four, and then returns a singular punt in week four and suffers like a knee strain on that play and misses the next like six or seven games. And then he steps in for the Jaguars' number one receiver when he gets hurt and it's kind of thrust into that role as the entire season is burning down around them. Yes. He definitely flashed at times. He had a really nice catch against the Bengals. And, but, you know, this offseason, it's basically the first time he's been completely healthy in his entire NFL career. He looked a lot more explosive, a lot more dynamic. I'm not sure there's, like, a big role for him in the present just because his role seems to be, like, Christian Kirk's, like, body double. But just in terms of guys who have, like, it seems like if they ever do hit the field, he could do, make some noise. He seems like an option. That's a pretty interesting answer because he made ever so slightly some noise. Like, some of us, more like for a six round pick, 
you know, yeah, like exactly. uh, for like a flyer. Like he was like their like tenth player pick or something like that. He scored a few touchdowns. He had like six or seven targets a few times. So yeah, you 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 have to be at least somebody to do that. Yeah, that's pretty exactly. And and he looks significantly better now, I think, than he did at any like practices I saw, whether training camp, OTAs, or during the season last year. And he just turned 22 this spring. I, of course, did not know that off the top of my head. I'm, I'm on his pro football room. It's, oh, wow, this guy's still only 22, huh? Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, really interesting stuff from John this year and every year. Uh, we, we always read you at Sports Illustrated. I'm always reading you on Twitter or X if you insist on calling that. Uh, so, yeah, where, where can people find you? What are you working on? What's your social media handles? Uh, yeah. That nature? So, my Twitter handle, it's at underscore John underscore Shipley. There's a John Shipley sports writer in Minnesota who's like 80. Who beat no, me. I've come across that guy. Yeah, yeah. He beat me to the punch there. <laughs> so you can find me at si.com slash NFL slash Jaguars or Jaguars on SI. Uh, you can find me at the Jaguars on SI podcast with my co-host Gus Logue. And I'll, right now, you know, before training camp, I'm just working on some pre-training camp questions, position battles, especially at uh, wide receivers. And then, you know, o- overall just – what big things are we looking for ahead training camp? And I'm also doing a top 25 Jaguars for 2024 list. So you can see which offensive players, fantasy wise, where they go ahead and land. I want to say skill wise player. I think ETN is the highest. He's going to come in pretty high. Awesome stuff. Always awesome stuff. The Jags. We read everything you write. Uh, amazing social media. I love your social media presence, by the way. <laughs> a nice wry presence on Twitter. I, I, I appreciate it. Some. I have to take a little mini break sometimes and yeah, you know. turn, turn, turn it back, but I'm I'm ready to get going next week. Yeah, I, I you're always ready. I can tell on Twitter, and uh, we love it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us, John. Appreciate it. I'm sure I'm sure we'll do it again next year. Absolutely. So thank you so much to John. Thank you so much to James Boyd from the Athletic on the Colts beat. Thank you so much to Nick Suss from the Nashville Tennessean on the Titans beat. Um, not thank you to Kyle and I. We didn't get around to discussing the Houston Texans. Um, so uh, we only previewed 75% of the division. You can check out my Texans team preview article, though, that I posted last week. A lot of stuff in the Texans in there. We've debated on this show a lot already. Uh, Steph Diggs versus Nico Collins versus Tank Dell. We'll do so more this summer. Uh, the Texans are a very interesting team, but a little more settled than some of these other teams. Uh, so check out that team preview if you're really dying for some Texans team content. Easy to find on rotoworld.com. I'll be at this awesome stuff. We'll be back uh, later this week, tomorrow, actually, with the Charlotte Observer's Mike K and Fantasy Life's Ian Harditz to break down the NFC South. So thank you so much to James. Thank you so much to Nick. Thank you so much to John. Uh, For Kyle Dvorak, I am Patrick Darty. We'll be back in 24 hours.